Particle physics is 20th century science, but in order to understand it, it's useful to go back in time a little bit and ask about the prehistory, the development of ideas that led up to our understanding of what the world is made of. And so I want to talk today about atoms and the idea of atoms. It's going to be useful to ask, what do we know? What do we believe today? And why? Why do we believe these things? I'd like to begin with a quote from a very famous physicist named Richard Feynman. Uh, Feynman was a physicist at Caltech, and he was a very influential player in the development of many of the ideas of modern physics. He, uh, he was, in a certain sense, responsible for the ideas that we have today of light and matter and their interactions. Richard Feynman is also famous for his uh, involvement in the investigation of the space shuttle explosion. He was the one who discovered that it was the O-ring that was faulty in the Challenger explosion. Here's a quote from Mr. Feynman. If in some cataclysm all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? This is typical Feynman, right? It's a very creative idea. What one sentence can you come up with that carries the most useful information to someone who's trying to redevelop ideas of science? So here's his answer. I believe it is the atomic hypothesis, or the atomic fact, or whatever you want to call it, that all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they're far apart, repelling if you squeeze them too close together, that's it. In that one sentence, you will see there is an enormous amount of information about the world if just a little imagination and thinking are applied. That's Mr. Feynman's idea of the single most useful sentence about modern science. The world is made of atoms. Once you appreciate this idea, you begin to understand a wealth of data, of ideas, of concepts about how the world works. You begin to understand why gases behave the way they do, and liquids, and solids, vapors, and just about anything that you can think of that describes how the world works boils down to this idea that the world is made of atoms. This idea begins already 2,500 years ago. There were Greek philosophers who were debating about how is the world constructed. Can you divide the world up into an infinite number of little pieces, or do you get to a bottom solid object, the atom. It was Democritus who had that idea first. And at that time, it wasn't really science. It was philosophy. People were just debating and thinking about how they believed the world should be. And it really wasn't until the 1600s and the 1700s that science began to develop an approach where you could ask the question of the world rather than asking the question of your ideas about the world. So this is the scientific method, right? You have a hypothesis. I propose that the world is made of atoms. Let us try to figure out what are the consequences of that idea. Let's think about quantitative consequences and then test them. We'll go in the laboratory. And so that testing begins in the 1800s with chemistry. Chemists are tinkering with combining materials and looking to see what happens. I remember when I was a little kid, I was given a chemistry set uh, you know, I was interested in science, and my parents must have thought this would be a useful thing for me. And I didn't really like it so much, because I didn't know what was going on. I, I had these chemicals, little vials, and they, uh, they had instructions. And they would say, mix a little, two parts of this one with one part of that one, and hey, look, the color changes. And it was kind of fun, but I didn't get it. I didn't have any idea of what was going on. And the chemists of the early 1800s, John Dalton is perhaps the name most famous uh, as the father of chemistry. He was doing the same kind of things as I was, but I guess he was a little smarter than I was when I was a kid. And he began to realize that there's a great deal of order and regularity in what happens when you start playing with chemicals. One of the things that he investigated in particular was making careful measurements of weights. So for instance, suppose you start with a vial of gas which is identified to chemists in the early 1800s. Nowadays, we might call it a flask of carbon monoxide. And you heat it up, maybe you add some electricity, and that gas will separate, and out of it will come a little dust, some carbon dust, and another gas with different chemical properties, oxygen, 
And you can weigh the oxygen that comes out and weigh the carbon dust that falls down. And what you'll discover is that the amount of carbon to the amount of oxygen always comes out in the same ratio, 12 parts carbon to 16 parts oxygen. So he started doing this with a whole array of materials. Of course, they didn't call it carbon monoxide back then. That's the modern terminology which reflects our understanding that carbon monoxide is a gas containing a carbon atom and an oxygen atom. And what Dalton's brilliance in this story really boils down to is he realized that you could explain it. It always comes out 12 parts carbon to 16 parts oxygen. You can understand that if you have the idea in your head that carbon is a little physical entity that weighs 12 somethings and oxygen is a little physical entity that weighs 16 somethings. Dalton didn't know what that unit was, that quantity, the mass of an individual uh, atom, but he knew the relative masses. And so as you go through all the different materials that were known, you begin to isolate various elements. Hydrogen is the lightest. Hydrogen on this scale would have mass one. And then you have other elements, lithium and carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. All of the fundamental elements are synthesized, isolated, and all the processes that you can then do with these elements, like mixing them together and making the color change, now make sense to anybody who's thinking about it, who talks with Dalton, reads his works, because now you understand that the world is made of atoms, and so chemical reactions are nothing more than take an atom from here, atom from there, combine them together, the result will have a certain well-defined mass, because the constituents did. Once you understand this idea, chemistry begins to fall into place. Instead of being mystical and a little bit magical, mixing beakers together, it just makes sense. And once chemistry begins to make sense, so does biology and geology and pretty much any process where you're dealing with physical materials and the amounts and the volumes, anything that you can measure about them. This idea was originated by chemists, but it developed further by physicists. And the physicists were more interested not in what happens when you mix stuff together, but for instance, just take a chunk of material and heat it up. If you add a certain amount of energy, if you do a certain amount of work, how much does the temperature go up? It's a perfectly well-defined physical question and people went into the laboratory. And so there was some data on this. And the data, it turned out, fit beautifully with this idea that the material was made up of little atoms, little individual atoms. People began to understand, for example, the ideal gas laws. That's a a phrase which refers to the fact that if you take a beaker of, or a vial of gas with a piston and you compress it, the temperature might go up as the volume goes down or the pressure might go up. And at first that just seems mysterious and a little bit magical. And then you say to yourself, look, let's imagine, let's imagine a balloon filled with a gas. Okay. Why is there a pressure? Why do I have to squeeze to make that balloon compress? You could just say, well, that's a property of balloons, but you could also say it's because there's gas in there made of little teeny atoms, little balls flying around like crazy, and they're whacking into the walls of the balloon, and there's lots of them, right? They're tiny. So what you feel when you're pressing on the balloon is you're feeling a whole bunch of little bumps which average out to a nice smooth pressure, and if you squeeze it, Okay, then these little atoms have less room to jiggle around in. They're going to hit the walls more frequently, and so you're going to feel more pressure. You can even get quantitative about this, put in some numbers, and it all works. It makes sense. So the idea of atoms is developing. The primary philosophy here is we have this hypothesis. We try to make quantitative predictions, and then we verify them in the laboratory. And the picture is really quite simple underneath. And it's explaining now pressures of gases. And as time went by, people argued, ah, look, it explains uh, temperature behaviors. As you heat something up, uh, it expands, um, stresses and strains, crystal properties. It's a long list, and it continues to develop even today. The evidence for atoms is indirect. We're not actually seeing these little things. We're seeing the consequences, the scientific consequences of these things. There was a physicist, an Austrian physicist, in the late 1800s, Ludwig Boltzmann. 
He was a very interesting character. He developed the mathematics of what's called thermodynamics and uh, it's hard to say, statistical physics. Um, Ludwig Boltzmann said, look, if you have, for example, a gas, and it consists of a whole bunch of little atoms in there, okay, this is the mental model that we have, we should be able to make quantitative predictions based just on probability and statistics. If you've got a whole bunch of particles, for example, it's going to be just as likely that they're whacking on the right-hand side as that they're going to be whacking on the left-hand side. So the pressure should be equal on both sides of your container, no matter what its shape is. Ludwig Boltzmann was a big proponent of the idea of atoms. And in the late 1800s, even though chemistry was well-developed and physics was well-developed, there were still big debates about whether atoms were real. It's a lovely question. What does it mean to argue whether atoms are real or not? Maybe they're just a fiction. Maybe it's just a kind of a mathematical tool to help us to order and understand the world. But it's possible that it doesn't really make sense to talk about little microscopic things that are so small you can't even see them. Right? Nobody has ever seen an atom, even today. I can show you pictures, electron uh, tunneling microscope pictures, but it's really a computer rendition of a scientific instrument's uh, measurements. You can't see an atom with your eyes, and you never will, because they're too small. They're actually smaller than the wavelength of visible light. And you can't see something that's smaller than the wavelength of the light you use to look at it. So this was a big debate in the late 1800s. Are atoms real, or are they some kind of mathematical fiction which is just being used to order and explain all of this data. Ludwig Boltzmann was really trying to make convincing mathematical arguments, but he didn't convince everybody. And he was a, quite a tragic figure. Ludwig Boltzmann ended up committing suicide in 1905, and uh, the reasons are a little bit mysterious, but some people think it was because he was so frustrated with the antagonism and arguments that he was getting in scientific conferences and with meetings because there were a bunch of big, powerful physicists, influential physicists, who just didn't believe that it made sense to talk about an object that was so small you could never directly see it. It's ironic that Ludwig Boltzmann died in 1905, because that was the year that Albert Einstein published a paper on something called Brownian motion. Brownian motion is the following phenomenon. Take a little teeny object, but one that you can still just barely see, like a little dust grain or a little piece of pollen, and put it in a fluid and watch carefully. Mr. Brown did this experiment in the early 1800s, and what he saw was that little grain would jiggle around, kind of like a drunken sailor, just this way and that way, and uh, kind of the way I uh, lecture to you, jittering around the lecture hall. This motion... At first, Mr. Brown said, well, maybe it's because that little pollen grain is alive. Maybe it's got some little flagella and it's moving around. It was a nice idea, but then he tried it with dust and dirt, and no matter what he put in there, they all behaved the same way. So his idea was, well, he didn't know. Mr. Brown just thought it was a mystery, a random motion of particles. But Mr. Einstein, in 1905, came up with a real quantitative explanation. He said... Look, if you have a little teeny object, it's just barely visible, and it's surrounded by atoms, and they're real, they're whacking into it from all sides. And although it's random, and on average there's going to be equal numbers of bumps on the right and equal numbers of bumps on the left, from time to time there might be, oh, a few more bumps on the right side, just briefly, and so the thing will jitter to the left. And then maybe later there'll be a few more bumps on the top, and it'll jitter down. So that's why objects do a random walk. It's because they're so small that it begins to become noticeable that atoms are around it, and they're smaller than it, but not infinitely smaller than it. And so this is now a direct evidence of the physical existence of these little teeny balls, whatever they are, these little atoms, whacking into objects. There was further evidence and understanding of the physical reality of atoms around this period of time, the late 1800s. And uh, this other evidence came from a chemist in Russia by the name of Dmitry Mendeleev. Mendeleev was a chemistry professor, and he was trying to understand all the different elements that people knew about, hydrogen and 
lithium and sodium and all of these different elements, the elements that we now see on what's known as the periodic table that shows up you know, in the corner of the lecture hall when you take a high school science class. It was Mr. Mendeleev who invented that table. What he was doing was he just had little cards and on each card he would write down you know, the name of the element, the known weight or mass or the relative weight I should say of that element and uh, certain chemical properties, how reactive it was for example. And he noticed that if you just lay the cards out in increasing mass, well, you got, I don't know, 60 or 70 cards. These are all the fundamental atoms that people know about in the late 1800s. But he, instead of just laying them out in a horizontal row, he started organizing them in a table, starting from the lightest, working his way up, heavier and heavier. And in the columns, he would make sure that the element going down a column would have the same chemical properties. So hydrogen is on the first row, and then he didn't know about helium yet. So the next element was lithium, which weighs about seven times as much as hydrogen. And it's very chemically similar. It's highly reactive. It's metallic and uh, hydrogen is gaseous, but the chemical reactive properties were about the same. And so in this way, he formed a table. And this table organized the atoms in a very beautiful way. In fact, it was stunning that you could do this. Some people were arguing about whether it was just an accident. In particular, there were certain places on that periodic table where there was a hole. It just didn't make sense to put an element there, so you just had to leave a gap and start continuing the elements further along in the table. Mendeleev thought that this table was significant. He didn't think it was accident or numerology. He thought that it was telling us something about the nature of atoms. And indeed it was. So for example, one of those gaps he could say, look, we haven't found any material, but if my table is correct, I predict the existence of a new material, a new fundamental material, which is indivisible by any chemical means, and it should have the following mass and the following chemical properties. He could really tell you what to look for. And so people went out and looked for these things. And within a decade, uh, gallium was discovered in the late 1800s, 1875. Germanium was discovered in 1896. These were the gaps in his table. So the discovery of these new elements predicted by a chemist was really a radical and profound uh, proof, evidence, that this idea that there are fundamental atoms and that they are orderly, that there is some sense to this organization, it was all beginning to come together. Now, today, we still don't have direct visual evidence of the existence of atoms, but we have incredibly powerful circumstantial evidence. Brownian motion, I think, was the one that convinced the world. Albert Einstein's paper, which quantitatively predicted how these objects should move if atoms were real. This is the game you play in science. It's a what if. If I believe in the existence of atoms, then I conclude that a pollen grain will jiggle in the following ways with the following frequency and so on. People were making estimates about the properties of atoms they were still crude in the late 1800s, but they seemed to be objects with a definite size. That size was tiny. In the metric system, it's 10 to the negative 10th meters. It's a little ball, about 10 to the negative 10th meters. And it didn't seem to matter which element you were looking at. They're all roughly the same size. All atoms are objects. They have different masses, but they have the same size. And this atomic hypothesis becomes firm science, but it's still not understood in a deep way in this era. People are just describing what's going on without really being able to say why. So I want to sort of take a step back from this early development and talk a little bit about the scientific method and the sort of question of how do you know what you know? Why do you believe these things? So as a metaphor for this developing picture of atoms, I want to step back in history and look at the development of another model, one that's a little bit easier for us all to visualize, which is the planetary model. Okay, go back to the 1500s, and people are debating about whether the Earth is at the center of the universe, or whether the Sun is at the center, or whether there's something else going on. There are various competing ideas. These ideas are backed up by some data. People have been observing the motion of the planets in the night sky, for example, but it's still kind of weak science. There isn't this idea of 
let's work out rigorous mathematical consequences of our ideas and then check and confirm whether the data agrees. This process really began with the data taken by a Danish astronomer by the name of Tycho Brahe. I love that name. Tycho was a, an amazing character, a uh, very dynamic man. He, uh, he was in a duel in his youth and lost part of his nose, so he had a metal nose. And he was um, favored by the king of Denmark. And uh, so this was the first example of big science. Here was this guy. He developed a research program. He got funding from the government. He got a research laboratory, which was an island off the coast of Denmark. And he took great data, took excellent data of the motion of planets through the night sky. Now, Mr. Brahe had an idea about how the solar system worked, which was, by modern standards, kind of confused. He, uh, he thought that the sun was at the center and the Earth rotates around it, but then the other planets go around the Earth. It was some complicated system. But he wasn't really interested so much in proving his idea as he was in just collecting the data. This is the first step in a scientific approach. It was his disciple, Johannes Kepler, who really took the next big important step in the development of science, he had to wait until Tycho died because Tycho coveted his data. In those days, you didn't publish or perish, you just held on to your data, it was valuable. And so once Tycho was gone, Johannes Kepler was able to take the data and analyze it. Now Kepler had this idea, which had been espoused earlier by Copernicus, that the sun is at the middle and the, all the planets are orbiting around it. Copernicus had thought that the planets were going around in circles, and Kepler said, let's ask the data. Let's not be philosophers about this. Let's be scientists. So he looked at the data. He made incredibly careful measurements and calculations and determined that the data implied that planets are not going around us. They are going around the sun, and they're traveling in ellipses, not in circles, slightly squashed circles. So this is Kepler's brilliant achievement is just describing the data accurately. He's not explaining it. He doesn't tell us why does a planet move in an elliptical orbit. He's just saying it does. This is what the data shows. That's very important. When you're first looking at confusing data, just describe it. However, if you really want to understand something, if you really want to do science, you need to go deeper than that. You need to look at the data and explain it based on some fundamental principles. And the person who did that was Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton is sort of the hero of any course, excuse me, any course on uh, elementary physics. Isaac Newton was born in the 1600s and he knew about the data of Kepler. He knew about the works of Galileo. He was, in a certain sense, the first real scientist. He, in fact, wrote a book, The Principia, in which he laid out what we now call the scientific method. He said, we need hypotheses, they need to have mathematical consequences, we need to be able to make predictions about what you will see in the laboratory, we need to do experiments to verify those predictions, and then we need to check that the whole story is consistent. And if it's not, we have to go back, fix up our hypotheses, or check our calculations. This method that Isaac Newton developed, he applied, in this case, to the planetary motion. So he's got this data that planets are moving in ellipses, and he's trying to understand why. Now, Isaac Newton is famous for sitting in an orchard and seeing an apple fall down and realizing that the force of gravity which pulls the apple down is a universal force. And if gravity can pull an apple, how high can it reach? Can it reach up to the moon? This was, this was uh, Isaac Newton's really brilliant insight into how the world works. Why does the moon not fly away from planet Earth? Why does it stay in orbit? And according to Newton, the answer is because there's a force of gravity holding it in. Why does the planet Earth not fly away from the sun? Because there's a force of gravity attracting us. So we go around in, a, in an orbit. So now he says, okay, I've got this idea of gravity. And he worked out a formula which tells you quantitatively how gravity depends on the mass of the objects and how far apart they are. And then he applies this. He says, suppose that... We have a solar system with a heavy sun and a massive planet Earth. What would our motion be? So in order to do this, he had to develop some mathematics. In fact, he invented calculus. Very smart guy. Isaac Newton is, in my mind, the smartest human being, or at least the smartest scientist who ever lived. He creates science. He invents calculus. 
He discovers the laws of motion. The physics that Isaac Newton discovered and wrote in the Principia has survived even today. It is the basis for pretty much all ordinary world science and physics in particular that we do. Amazing character. He had a brain the size of our planet. He was also not a very nice fellow. He never married. Uh, he was kind of, kind of the archetypal nerd. He worked really hard. He had this incredible ability to focus on what he was thinking about. Not a nice guy. He had a lot of enemies. Um, I think he was always worried that he might find somebody who was half as smart as he was. So Isaac Newton has taken Kepler's ideas and started from scratch at some deeper level. He has said, I believe that there is a universal law of gravity which applies to all objects. And by applying this law, he has deduced that planets move in elliptical orbits and that they have the various properties, the period and the radius relationship that Kepler had also observed. So Isaac Newton is explaining Kepler's summary of the data. So now we have a much deeper understanding of planetary motion. It's no longer just a theory. It is now a deep, rigorous mathematical framework. And instead of reproducing the data that was already taken, you can now begin to make predictions. What would happen if we launched a rocket? What would happen if we tried to send people to the moon or to Mars? We can use Newton's laws and they will tell us exactly how to do that. And of course, this has succeeded spectacularly. I think that scientists were satisfied with the picture of atoms in the late 1800s as a description of nature. Right? So going back from Newton and his development of the scientific method to our development of the idea of atoms, people were satisfied with the idea that atoms are real, they're physical objects, little teeny things that uh, bounce around and interact with one another. They can explain an enormous wealth of data about physical properties of materials and chemistry and from that biology. But there was still a, a kind of a lack of understanding of the underlying theory. It was like we were at the stage of Kepler describing what was going on, but we didn't yet have our Isaac Newton to explain what is an atom? What is it made of? Why does it interact the way it does? Why does the periodic table appear as we've seen it in our high school chemistry class in these lovely rows and columns, why is it that there is this ordering to the atoms? In order to develop that idea, we needed something more, something beyond the physics of the 16, 17, 1800s. What was missing was quantum physics and relativity. The transition from classical physics of the Newtonian era, all the way up through the 1800s, to what we now call modern physics, which is these ideas of how things work when they're really tiny, that transition had not yet been made. There were some hints out there, and we're going to be talking in the next lecture about what those hints were that physics was not quite done in the late 1800s. Let me tell you about sort of two of those primary hints. Number one, Around the same time that the periodic table was being developed, published, understood, we also were discovering a new phenomenon of nature, radioactivity. The radioactivity didn't fit in with this scheme of atoms. Very mysterious. Energy just spontaneously being generated and spewing out of some certain unusual materials didn't fit in with the classical picture. That was one clue that we didn't really understand everything about the world. In fact, when you had radioactivity, you observed this bizarre phenomenon that an atom, like a nitrogen atom, could change, if you bombarded it with radioactivity, into a different kind of atom. You could convert nitrogen into oxygen. This goes against all of the ideas of chemistry, which says the world is made of atoms, nitrogen is one kind of atom, oxygen is another kind of atom, and they can bounce, they can stick together, but they can't change. They are indivisible and immutable. Remember, atom comes from the word atomos, which means uncuttable. So radioactivity was a puzzle. There were other puzzles at the time. For example, when you heat materials up and you look at their glow, this is an easy phenomenon to observe. Look at your oven. It glows red hot. 
if you try to calculate using the laws of classical physics what's going on, you discover that they don't agree with the data. So next time we're going to talk about these conflicts with, between classical physics and the experiment that lead us to a deeper understanding of what are atoms, what are they made of, what are they really at some deep level, what's the theory.